Tonight, the first look. The FBI releasing new images, what Donald Trump's wannabe assassin had in his backpack, how he used an electrical unit to try to get to the top of the roof. Plus, Kamala Harris reemerges. Parts of Georgia on her mind. But is that time well spent? Also tonight, could the presidential race come down to a tie? And one city in particular. Why the race for the White House could run through Omaha. I'll explain the path to 270 when I speak with that area's top lawmaker. And college football is nearly here. Thank goodness. And now some legislators in Ohio are actually pushing for a new law calling offsides on streaming. What's that all about? We're speaking with them live. Welcome to Washington and the most politically unpredictable show on all of television. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. So maybe, just maybe, we will know 10 weeks from tonight who will be the next president of the United States. If it's not known, we hope to have a pretty decent idea. I'll get to the state of the race here with 69 days to go in a moment. But first, tonight, still many questions about what happened 46 days ago in Butler, Pennsylvania. The FBI finally releasing today these images of how the shooter scaled onto a nearby roof to get a clean look through his rifle at Donald Trump. You see that tan electrical box there on the right side of the screen? The FBI now says the shooter used that unit to help get him onto the roof. He carried with him this backpack right here. The FBI says the shooter likely disassembled his rifle, how you see there, so that it could fit inside. And once on top of the roof, the FBI tells us they recovered that rifle. But still, no precise motive other than the shooter being fixated on political violence and not on any one person in particular. A special agent in the Pittsburgh field office telling reporters today, quote, when the event was announced, he became hyper-focused on that specific event and looked at it as a target of opportunity, end quote. Now, Donald Trump not campaigning today. And for the first time since the convention, the Democratic National Convention, Kamala Harris is out on the trail tonight in the state of Georgia ahead of a bus tour there tomorrow. A couple unusual things to note here, first off. Go back in history for a moment. Al Gore, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton all campaigned the Monday after the convention. Barack Obama did so the very next day. The recent exception is President Biden during the height of covid It's taken Harris, though, more than 100 hours to get back before the public eye. And when she sits down for her first ever interview as a presidential candidate here in 2024, she'll have some help. Tim Walls, her running mate, will be by her side. Tonight, though, she is in Georgia. And if Harris were to win there, you could just about say it would be game over. She wins. Our DDHQ polling shows that Trump, though, is up nearly 3% there in Georgia, and as of this moment, has a 64% chance of winning that state. Just some of the dynamics. Joining me throughout the hour here on the Hill, Mick Mulvaney, News Nation political contributor, of course, the former chief of staff in the Trump administration. Scott Bolden, News Nation political contributor, former D.C. Democratic Party chairman. Linda Tran is the former senior advisor to Pete Buttigieg. And T.W. Origi, the uh, vice president of Push Digital Group, former communication aide to Mike Pompeo. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in. Uh, Appreciate it. Hello. Hello. Um, Georgia. Hello, Mick. Here's here's one of the things that I find fascinating about this. Kamala Harris out on the trail in Georgia. You were telling us about a year ago that Republicans said no way Donald Trump wins there. Yeah. The numbers now show otherwise. He's the clear favorite. What's changed? Um, I think for a long time, the prop, the, the change was Joe Biden, that he was so unpopular in Georgia that Trump actually had a chance. You might go back a year ago. Where was I getting this information? Elected Republicans in Georgia telling me that unless Trump could mend his fences with Governor Brian Kemp, it was going to be really, really hard for him to win that state. Of course, and Biden was struggling as much as he did. It, no, one, no one seemed to look at it. I'm wondering what the Harris campaign is thinking or seeing in their data to be sending her down there. Keep in mind, money is really important in a campaign, but the one thing you don't have enough of for any candidate is time. You could always tell where they think they can win by where that candidate is spending what's, their time. Yeah, what's, but, the, what's the strategy here? Because it seems like every now and again she reappears. 
go silent for a handful of days, get out on the trail, not talk to folks today, do an interview the Thursday before Labor Day weekend at 9 o'clock at night. Is, is that the strategy? It's kind of like Biden basement 2.0 in a different sense. I, I think the strategy is go everywhere you can to meet with voters. We saw this when she was in Pennsylvania doing the bus tour. It's And we're going to see it again now in Georgia for the next couple of days here. Part of what you're demonstrating as part of being there is the vitality of this candidate and her running mate. The fact that they can even be on a bus tour. I don't expect, Mick, you correct oh, me if co- I'm wrong. I don't expect to see Donald Trump. Yeah, but this. why was she off the t- campaign trail? I agree with that. But why not do anything for four days? Where, where, I, yeah. Yes, they should be out there, but why haven't they been out there? Well, why not? I mean, this campaign is a movement. Nothing's been according to to some process or procedure. It's historical. There's a lot of energy. And you know why she's in southern Georgia? Because there are a lot of black and brown voters in southern Uh, Georgia. So here's... There are a lot of black and brown voters in southern Georgia who are often ignored because they're red, red parts of the state. And she's going to not just get black and brown voters, but given how expansive her campaign is, there are going to be some moderate Republicans down there, too. And she's in play in Georgia and North Carolina. So, So why not go? Savannah, Georgia, black... Uh, 49%, white 37%, Liberty County, Georgia, just south and west of Savannah. Uh, the bl- down there also. Black population, 43%, yeah. white population, 40%. It's tough to build a winning coalition down there when you're taking four days off on the campaign trail. Just ask Herschel Walker. Uh, but the fact <laughs> is, is I think, I think we are at her high water mark. The breathless fawning that she's gotten from the media, the lack of interview think questions or you she's hope. taking... I think so. And I think James Carville's right when he says nationally she needs to be winning by three points in order because Trump always overperforms polls in order to win. She's up by the uh, real clear political average by 1.7 points after weeks of no hard questions of fawning media coverage. But this is the time she needs to to keep pedal to the metal. And she's backing off Hillary Biden. T.W., here's what I'm looking at, okay? Because I I saw the decision desk HQ stuff, the polling, right? That she's down by three in Georgia. And mm-hmm. she's there. Trump right. is down by three in Virginia and is going nowhere near it. So what are they seeing in Georgia that says, you know what, we we think we're better off in Georgia than we are in Pennsylvania because they're making that, that affirmative decision and they must be seeing something that I'm not. But they won four years ago. That's now, right. the, you had Ossoff and you had um, Warnock. Uh, Warnock. Warnock there, and that helped because those campaigns were all part of 2020. What, what I think the campaign is thinking is it's going to take a lot to, 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 re, to do that again. But given the energy behind Kamala Harris and the excitement, why not try it? Because if, if she wins Georgia, Biden won Georgia very, uh, by slim margin. She wins, it's game over. E- exactly. Close to. If- and so why not? And besides, Donald Trump was campaigning in, in the Bronx, New York. He's not going to win New York, and yet he's spending time and money there. Are we asking the same question? Some of that, though, was obviously when he was on trial and he had... Uh, uh, limitations, I guess you could say. That's also fundraising. Did he have an ankle so, bracelet yeah. yet? Oh no, he does. He, no, he, no he, there has not. There has I not been. There has not been sentencing in that case, as you very well know, Scott. <laughs> All right, joining us now uh, here on the Hill, Democratic Congressman from the state of North Carolina, frequent guest here on the Hill, Congressman Wiley Nickel. Congressman, thanks for being back with us. So great to be with you from the great state of North Carolina. Yes, from your home state, indeed. Um, so, so talk to me here, Congressman, because she didn't, Kamala Harris didn't do anything for five days, hasn't really said anything publicly today. Why? Well, I, I think you're, you're seeing her right now. She's got a bus tour going through Georgia, rural, rural counties. You know, that's where this election is going to be won or lost, especially in states like North Carolina and Georgia. So she's out there. She's talking to voters. She's talking about the, the kitchen table issues that matter to them. And you, you look on the other side and you see Donald Trump and his Project 2025 plans totally but out of is touch she with, though? With But is she, though? Voters. I mean, like... Sh- but is she, though, Congressman, she was we haven't seen her since since Thursday night. It's not like this is a race for the next 69 months. It's a race for the next 69 days. And she, she's she's gone 100 hours without showing up since the DNC. Well, yeah, I think I think the, the way the, the way this race is shaped up is totally different. We've never had a, a, a candidate for president who's started, uh, you know, this late in the game. So she's she's doing the stuff she needs to do. And it's working. She is ahead uh, this race is going to be very close, though. You know, I heard the, the commentary earlier. She's certainly the underdog in this race. But she's putting out policy proposals on issues that matter. She was here in Raleigh, uh, where I am right now, talking about her plans to cut down on price gouging at the grocery stores to help uh, you know, bring down the cost of housing, to help 
first-time parents with the child tax credit. Those are things that folks want to hear about here. And all I hear from Trump is continued you know, grievances, griping, plans to try to overturn an election. There's a huge contrast between you know, our candidate for president and, and the Republican nominee. One of the things that I respect about you, Congressman, is you come on this show all the time. There's times that might not be convenient for Democrats, right, earlier this summer uh, in this race, and, and you were always here. You were always willing to take the questions and answer them. I could not imagine a scenario, Congressman Wiley, in which you would give an interview with someone sitting next to you. Why is she doing it with Tim Walz? I think, I think it's great. You know, I, I think the more you Do hear you from them, the, the, the better. No, like, they're, they're like your chief of staff's that's... not sitting next to you at this interview. Well, you know, but I'm, I, you know, I'm a member of Congress. You don't run as a ticket. She runs as a ticket. And, and folks, I think the more folks get to know Tim Waltz, the better we do. I, I'm incredibly impressed uh, with, you know, his speech at the DNC and, you know, the, the just amazing energy and joy he's bringing to the race. Why wouldn't you want to have that with you? Um, you know, if you, if you but, but I have a partner, too. If you ever want to bring my wife on, first, though, I would right? love to bring like, her on with me. Sh- 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 shouldn't we hear from Kamala Harris herself, though? Right. And uh, like it, it's the first time she's ever done this. Well, I mean, she's done she's she does interviews, you know, with the, the traveling press that come with her. She talks to them and has done Not that really. over the, the course of the campaign. But, you know, it's a sit down interview. That's you know, if you want to sit down interview, you're going to get one. They're going to get to ask her all the questions they want. I think it's CNN. But she's going to do tons more of it. You know, the American people will get to hear from her and, and hopefully they're going to get to have two debates. Uh, I know Donald Trump doesn't want to have, uh, you know, her mic on when when he's talking. I, that's that's where I see that one. But I think that's just as equally important to talk about the need to to get you know both candidates in front of journalists who are going to ask questions and debates. And and I think with Trump too, if, if we're going to be fair, he's a guy who can't answer real questions from from normal voters. I, I would challenge him to go and do a town hall meeting where he talks to Democrats and independents and moderates because he can't answer those questions. He's a convicted felon. Look, I'm I'm not not sticking up for for Trump here, him or his policies, but there's a clear difference between how he's approached this campaign and how she's approached it. I mean, just earlier this week, he was out uh, taking questions in Virginia, taking questions in, uh, answering questions in Michigan. Anyways, um, let let me ask you this. Um, Georgia, what gives you hope that it's actually in play, Congressman? You, You see the numbers. You know how hard it is for Democrats to win that state. Why do you think uh, it could be back to back? Well, I, I think we have a proven record of success in, in Senate races, in the presidential election in Georgia, certainly in North Carolina, too. You know, and, and the question folks should be asking is, you know, where, where is the map? You know, if, if you're talking about Florida, you know, getting added to this list, it means real good things for Kamala Harris. If you're talking about Virginia and other states getting added, that's real bad. But right now, you know, we are at a place where we, we, weren't, we weren't here, you know, 40 days ago where we're talking about a candidate winning in Georgia, winning in North Carolina. Well, very close in Georgia. And, and at the end of the day, very close, you know, yeah. these races are going to come down to turnout. And that's what, that's what those, this bus tour is about. It's making sure people understand what's at stake in the election and motivating them to get out and vote. And, and I think that's why the, okay. you know, the more folks get to see and hear from Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, the better they're going to do. So I'm really encouraged by that. And, you know, and Bill Clinton did that in 92. He got out to rural America. You know, she is talking to every single voter in rural America as she's she's going through rural Georgia. Congressman Wiley Nickel, a Democrat from North Carolina. Again, thank you for being with us here on the Hill. Talk to you next time. Great to see you. You, you as well, sir. All right. Still much more ahead here on the Hill over the next 46 minutes or so is parenting now becoming a public health issue. That's right. The new warning from the Surgeon General, America's top doctor today for all you parents out there. Did you hear what he had to say? And is the American dream now just that? A dream and not a reality. The answer to what Americans think. When the Hill, here on News Nation returns. Welcome to Washington. 69 days to go till November 5th. All right, welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation. I woke up this morning, saw this, and went, whoa. Okay. Uh, A new warning from the U.S. Surgeon General. Parenting can be hazardous to your health. Dr. Vivek Murthy issuing an advisory today that highlighted recent surveys showing that nearly half of parents report, quote-unquote, overwhelming stress most most days compared to only 26% 
of other adults. There's not a crosstab for that on bedtime specifically. I'm sure that number would be higher. What is causing the stress? In part, money. 66% report feeling consumed by worries about their finances. So um, there's a lot here, obviously, right? What about possible solutions or, or how to get to the bottom of this? Well, the Surgeon General suggested a number of options, including child tax credits, universal pre-K and paid family leave, medical leave. But take a look at the estimated costs. You can see them there of these programs. If you were to institute all of them, the child tax credit, for example, a trillion and a half, universal pre-K, another 350 billion. You're talking about a couple trillion dollars here. Is this the solution to all of it? And is this what we might get if Kamala Harris wins the election? Um, I, I woke up, I read this. <laughs> Parents, kids, I'm a parent, I have Wait, kids. Went back to sleep. Uh, I went. No, I didn't go back to sleep. So I had to get the kids ready for school, and I thought to myself, "Look, I know nothing about what it was like to raise kids in 1984 when I was born. I know a lot about what it's like to raise kids right now in 2024, as 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 do you, well, Blake. At least you don't have to pay the two trillion dollars to get. I, I well, I kind of do though, well, part right? Of because it. that would be the part debt that gets passed down to me and to my kids, and that's why I wonder. Look, a lot of this stuff is valuable and would help parents. But is money the solution here? Well, I think there's a reason why these programs and policies have been part of the discussion, at least in democratic circles, for quite a number of cycles now. And part of it is about, yes, getting help to parents, but also getting help to parents of a certain socioeconomic status. So you and I sit here with our kids. We have these conversations. We have our day-to-day challenges, and it's yeah. hard to be a working parent. But if you're a single working parent single, or you're a low-income working parent, it's, in, it's impossible. And so part of this is about raising the tide for everybody. And being able to pay for it. Absolutely. I, I think one thing with, with Kamala Harris and Waltz is not only, okay, we love these programs. In fact, it was just endorsed by this foundation, your report. At the same time, though, it'll be important. How do you pay for it? Right? Yeah, so we've got $35 trillion in debt right now. It'll be $50 trillion in a decade. It'll probably be $100 trillion if we keep on going at this yeah. by the time my kids are my age. And that's, I guess, the balance here, right? Like, is, is money the, sol- the, the solution to this? I wonder what the former budget director thinks about all this. No, I'm trying really, really hard not to be cynical because I, mm-hmm. I am a cynic, but I think I've earned my cynicism. Let, let, hmm. me, let, me, show, let me tell you what the, the hardcore right wing is thinking about this report today. Okay. This is just Democrats being Democrats. Everything is now a, a syndrome. Everything is probably de- something that's going to qualify you for some government program. And if I really want to be really cynical, this is an argument for abortion. That chi- having a child is a mental health issue, and if you don't want to have that mental health issue, it's okay for you to get an abortion. I'm not going to be the only person who looks at that story and thinks, you know what? This is just part and parcel of a larger sort of anti-family initiative. You willing to go there? No, I understand where he's coming from for sure. Uh, as the only non-parent on the stage, I probably don't have the insight as, as You're well. You're less no, stressed but than us. But, well, I'm, I'm definitely. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but um, I, I would suspect that there is a non-financial component to the stress, the stressors that deal with the day-to-day raising it's of children be. in today's mm-hmm. world. Yeah. Uh, with social media the way it was, I know if I were to come downstairs and see my kid doing a TikTok dance or listening <laughs> to Boom or Doom, I'd be a bit frazzled. Yeah. The bullying, the Nonstop. So uh, I think there's a lot more to it. I don't think a price tag needs to be put on everything. But as J.D. Vance said a couple weeks ago, there can be there's a lot to be done. on. If you're married with children, you're two thirds more likely to be Republican. That's the world we live yeah. in. OK, but was your argument that this was a reason to get an abortion because parenting is too stressful? And that right wingers think that you don't know. You don't Democrats think there's not going to be some there? discussion someplace when someone's going to look. It is really tough to have kids. I, so if you feel like this is too much stress for you, there's a way out of this really? situation. I can guarantee. Do you think, you, it, do you think it's? That's I'm trying case. really hard not to be that simple. But you're but, being that way. I, yes, I am. I'm you voicing being that, that way. Is, right. is this I, is this in part teeing up Kamala Harris's policies? I think absolutely. I mean, there's a large conversation, again, that's been happening not just during this candidacy and this campaign cycle, right. but for a very long time. Cory Booker brought this up All right. during the so, last president. So, so that was from the Surgeon General today, J.D. Vance, by the way, uh, Donald Trump's running mate, facing criticism once again for comments he made a few years ago about women who do not have children. This time it was directed toward teachers at a speech he gave in October of 2021. Watch. So many of the leaders of the left, and I hate to be so personal about this, but they're people without kids trying to brainwash the minds of our children. And that really disorients me and it really disturbs me. Now, he went on to criticize the head of the American Federation of Teachers, basically the head of the teachers union, for not having any kids of her own. 
though she does have two stepchildren. Donald Trump has an, has a, an issue with women. It's been that way for years. And every single time something like this comes out with J.D. Vance, doesn't that just make it significantly worse? Yeah, he's been on the defensive about similar comments, but I think the head of the teachers union, Randy Weingarten, is awful. And I think she is the enemy of our children's education in America. I have no problem focusing the discussion on her policies and things like that. Uh, but look, I think J.D. Vance has always been driving to, uh, to uh, advocate for the family unit. He might not say it the best way, but coming from where he came from, he saw the value in having that and how it uh, impacts education. Doesn't always say it right, but I do think why he's do you, on the right the, track. Why do you left, think, the, the left looks at that statement and focuses on disorient me and disturbs me. The right looks at it as brainwashing. There's two different stories there. Why do you think, see let, let me leave you with this. Why do you think we haven't heard from J.D. Vance's wife? She could come forward, vouch for her husband, and say, this is the man I know, and, and sort of rise to it, but we haven't really heard that yet. You, you, you never want to get into somebody else's family operation. You don't know who that, you know, do you run together? Does the, does the wife involved? Is the husband involved? I haven't heard much from Doug Elmodorfer. Is that his name? Um, M. Like, Hoff. M. Hoff. M. Hoff. I mean, but so Mick, it's different for every different family. But Mick, why is he in everybody else's family business than J.D. Vance? This is weird. He has a problem if you don't have two and a half kids and two working parents and your wife had these had these kids. I mean, the, the, the whole family structure in 2024 is completely different. I've got three daughters, a granddaughter, and a bonus son, and uh, I, I, I've been married twice, and you know what? I've got a mixed family, and you know what? I write a lot of checks to the Democratic Party, and I care <laughs> deeply about this country. What is he talking about? So He's you're, obsessed with it. You're, you're going to have some say, this is inappropriate, right? And this hurts, and this hurts him, it hurts Trump, it hurts Republicans. Like T.W. said, you're going to have hear a lot on the right say, you know what, the teachers unions, there's something there and there's something that needs to change. It was the argument that was had during the height of COVID when a lot of parents were really upset how things played out. And it seems like a continuation in part right now. All right. Still to come here on the Hill, why one district in the state of Nebraska might play an important role in the election, maybe one of the biggest I'll speak with a congressman who represents that district. Coming up, why you should be paying attention to Omaha. Remember Peyton Manning used to go, (laughs) Omaha, Omaha. Telling you, Omaha is important. Stay with us. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Right now, a live look. J.D. Vance, a rally outside Green Bay, Wisconsin, where he continues to talk about the economy on this day. His visit there comes a day after the Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren also visited that area as part of an economic tour for Kamala Harris's campaign. And tonight, Harris is out on the campaign trail for the first time since the Democratic National Convention. She's in Georgia on a bus tour along with her running mate, Tim Walls. Donald Trump off the trail tonight after Midwest stops earlier this week. But his running mate, J.D. Vance, is in Pennsylvania, as we just mentioned there, trying to talk about the economy with truckers. We have not enough truckers and way too many computer coders. President Trump and I, we have a different message. Our truckers are irreplaceable, and we are going to fight for them every single day. Now, according to the latest polling average from The Hill and DDHQ, uh, Harris is up roughly four points nationally. But as we know, there are swing states that are significantly closer than that. And tonight, we're drilling down here into one area in particular. It's Nebraska. Yes, Nebraska. And here's why. Remember, Trump and Harris need 270 electoral college votes to win. But there are scenarios where you could get to a tie. 269, 269. It involves Omaha, Nebraska. So this is Nebraska right here. Five electoral college votes for Nebraska, but they do it differently there. If you win the state as a whole, you get two. But then the three congressional districts each get one. So the third district is the largest geographic area. The first district is right outside of Omaha. And then look at these three counties here. That is Nebraska, too. And that is one of the most watched areas will be in all of the country on election night. So let me ro- run through some, some scenarios here as to what could potentially happen and how you get to 269, 269. So if, Donald, if Kamala Harris were to win the blue wall and Donald Trump wins uh, all the states in, in the South and out West and Nebraska goes completely red, you get to 269, 269. There's some subtleties here with Maine as well. Um, but let's change the map a little bit, right? Let's say that doesn't play out. There's tons of scenarios. For example, in this one, the blue wall part, blue wall right here, 
goes red. Kamala Harris, let's flip it. She wins Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia, and Don Bacon's district, Republican, goes blue. What do you get? 269, 269. We can do this all day or for for quite some time, Um, but it goes to show why this district right here is so important. The congressman who represents that district is a Democrat. I just name-checked him, Don Bacon, joins us live here on the Hill. Congressman, thanks for being with us here on the show. Appreciate it. Um, Let's start there. Is the election going to come down to where you live? Well, first of all, I got to point out I'm a Republican, uh, but it did go for Biden last time. And uh, the say Democrat? The district, I'm a Republican. Yeah, no, no, no. That, sorry. I, 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 no, I, I, I know <laughs> that. Good. If I said Democrat, I, I apologize. I know, ex- I know exactly who you are. Um, it, 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 I so may have just it, misheard it, but that's all good. No worries. Hey, so it, it's, district. Yeah, is the election going to come down to it? I, I, I think there's some, you know, there's odds that it's possible. I don't know if it's likely. I do think President Trump, if he could stay on message and focus on, you know, the economy, border and crime, and also Vice President Harris's very liberal voting record in the Senate and what she campaigned on in 2020, he's going to win Georgia. He'll win back Arizona. Uh, he'll be competitive in this district. Uh, you know, it's still, it'll be 50-50, uh, but he's got to stay on message. Uh, but I do think he has a good chance of uh, taking back Georgia and Arizona. And so it's, and the other one's going to be a hard fight. And so this district, you know, I, I would say right now, the latest polling we had, I'm up two, and Vice President Harris yeah. was up eight. And there was another poll that came out yesterday showing Harris was up five. But I really believe this district leans Republican, but they want to know that you want to govern and that you want to work across the aisle and get things done. And as much as President Trump, former President Trump, so is, communicate that, the better for him here. Is Donald Trump then a drag on you in your, in your re-election chance? That's, that's, I guess, what the numbers would suggest. I wonder if you believe that to be the case. Well, it's in 2020, uh, he lost by six and a half, and I won by 4.6. And again, our district, they like center-right politics, but they want you to govern, and they want you to be respectful. And I just think if the president talks about the issues, doesn't get into character attacks and, and name-calling, but focuses on the environment or the economy, the border, uh, crime, and the, and the liberal voting record of Vice President Harris, he will do well here. Our governor is a Republican. He won this district. Our county sheriff, Republican, won this district. Our, our county attorney, Republican, won this district. You can win here as a Republican, but you've got to be a governing Republican and, and be focused on issues and, and be respectful and discreet. Uh, so you talk about respect and being respectful. Um, there was an, an incident that happened seemingly just down the road from us here at Arlington National Cemetery the other day, Congressman. Uh, Donald Trump was there to pay his respects to the 13 service members, U.S. soldiers, who were killed at Abbey Gate in Afghanistan during the uh, botched withdrawal there. There was an incident because you're not supposed to film on the grounds there. Uh, They say over at Arlington National Cemetery, that is indeed what happened. And J.D. Vance alluded to this earlier today when he was out on the trail. I want to play for you what he said and get your reaction on the other side. We're going to talk about a story out of those 13 brave, innocent Americans who lost their lives. It's that Kamala Harris is so asleep at the wheel that she won't even do an investigation into what happened. And she wants to yell at Donald Trump because he showed up. She can she can go to hell. That was J.D. Vance. Is that the correct response? And was the Trump campaign doing the right thing by filming at Arlington National Cemetery? You know, I know JD's a believer, a Christian, and we should raise the bar on how we talk about, uh, talk to our opponents about our opponents. I really think Middle America wants to see a, a, a more decent conversation style. I would also point out two things can be true at once. One, we should follow the rules at Arlington. I was a flag bearer there. I helped bury 12 people at mm-hmm. Arlington and was the flag bearer there. We should follow the rules. I would say also, on the other hand, though, the families there are mad at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Because they claim, and I'm not, I'm not in those families, I know one family very well, that neither one have ever contacted them, but President Trump has. And so there, there is anger towards President Biden and Vice President Harris and how they've been treated, these 13 families, and uh, they appreciate President Trump. So I think 
a, a, a true reporting of the story. Yeah, it's supposed to obey the rules of, of Arlington, but let's all understand the feelings of these 13 families who feel wounded by Biden and Harris and how they've treated these 13 families. So I think both things could be true, and I think both should be reported. Congressman Don Bacon, Republican from Nebraska. As I was going through the Democrat, Republican, Republican, Democrat scenario, I might have called you a Democrat. I know you're a Republican. There's lots of possibilities out there, and he is in one of the most, as he just outlined, fascinating districts of them all. Congressman, hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) We'll leave it there. Thank you, sir. You got it. All right. You are looking live right now, Savannah, Georgia, uh, where Kamala Harris, Tim Walls. Would you look at this? Do, Do we have audio of this? I'm going to stop talking for a second. Let's go audio full. Congratulations on all the success. I've been reading enough. All that you've been doing. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm tired right now. What time do you get here? We're going to go right now. 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 So Kamala Harris live there in Savannah, Georgia. Mick, you were shaking your head during this. Why? Uh, this is what she's not good at. This is why she dropped out of Iowa before the oh, Iowa... Con- speaking uh, of dropped out, there's the pic, the image. The Iowa primary in, in 2020. She's not good at retail politics. She's good on the stage. She's good with a teleprompter. Do you want... We'll see how she does here. You want her doing this? I'll, ladies first, I'll start with you. I mean, I'm not worried about Kamala Harris <laughs> talking to voters at all. I mean, there's a reason why people are so what, excited to be around her. What did you see in that clip, that live clip, that told you that she wasn't good at retail yeah, politics? Could. She was engaging. She was listening. She was smiling. People were talking to her. They were explaining, I think, their job or what they were... What they were doing here? There's a massive crowd. A massive crowd. What is so wrong with that? I'll give you you two the last word. Why are the Republicans yeah, uh, so negative <laughs> all the time? Well, because history is on our side. She didn't do so well when she ran for president. The <laughs> yeah, first but that's time a different because candidate. She stunk uh, in person and she stunk in, during interviews. So that's why. Experience. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't let her do it. Okay. All right. She's, Former the momentum is on her side. Why change the formula? So I, I, she didn't get popular by doing what she's doing right there. She looked pretty popular to me. All right. Still to come here <laughs> on the Hill. Speaking of popular, college football almost here. How do you plan to watch the game? Games. There are lawmakers in Ohio who are trying to institute a new law as it relates to how you watch college football and how you pay for it. This Michigan grad. Interviewing two Ohio State lawmaking fans on the other side of the break. And later, speaking of flags, uh, the fight over our flag. Why an Oklahoma community is rallying behind one patriotic student. I've seen a lot of crazy things in my career, but even I was shocked when I opened my mail recently. You won't believe what the happy face killer sent me, and you'll only see it on News Nation. Banfield tonight, 10 9 Central, only on News Nation. Second quarter earnings report today. Get this, bringing in $30 billion in revenue. But it is facing some potential headwinds, too, as the Department of Justice is reportedly probing in allegations that NVIDIA may have abused its market dominance. Perhaps the DOJ looking into them. But perhaps even more remarkable, Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, his company Berkshire Hathaway, passed the $1 trillion mark in market value today. Wild. All right, this Saturday ushers in, speaking of money, The kickoff of college football. (laughs) And in a state that lives and breathes its football, there is a new bipartisan pushback on one thing in particular, whether you should have to pay to watch certain games. A group of lawmakers introducing legislation aimed at prohibiting universities from signing exclusive deals with streaming services. Now, why might that be a problem, you ask? Well, last year, Ohio State's game against Purdue, for example, was aired exclusively on Peacock, meaning at the time you had to buy the service to watch. Unsurprisingly, that caught the ire of fans and lawmakers in Ohio. And it's not an isolated incident, by the way. Last year, the congressman from the state of New York, Pat Ryan, had a similar issue with the National Football League. He ended up threatening the league's antitrust exemption for a Bills game that was on streaming and which fans had to pay for. Joining us now is one of the lawmakers in the state of Ohio. He is a Democrat, Senator Bill DeMora. Uh, Senator DeMora, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate it. Full disclosure, Thank I'm a graduate of the National Champion University of Michigan. I'm guessing you're a University of Michigan. You're an Ohio State fan. 
We leave that there and uh, set an that alum. aside. I'm an alum of Ohio State. I represent the university in my Senate district. And, of course, you guys cheated last year, so. All right. Well, <laughs> we've got our natty, and we'll defend it on Saturday. Um, let's set it aside, though. So explain to me the issue here, because there's, there's Republicans and Democrats in your state who, who don't like what's going on, and, you, and you're trying to make law about it. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous that for the first time in 26 years last year, we couldn't watch an Ohio State game on a regular network that we had to pay extra streaming service for it. Um, bars and restaurants in my district and across the state who depend on having the Ohio State football game on Saturdays for their, their revenue had to pay exorbitant amounts of money to get the game. The streaming service was horrible during the game. And it's, I mean, it's ridiculous that the Big Ten Conference and other universities are making these such huge deals and they screw the fan. And I'm going to do, I'm hoping to do something about it both at a statewide level and to help the students because the students on campus had to pay an extra three dollars to watch the game as well even though they're on the university's internet service and yeah it's ridiculous they have to pay extra to their own classmates play sports and i hear you on football. i hear you on prices um and, you know and, and the students have to pay and you want to make that free but you know i was looking up um student tickets for example 34 bucks for a non-conference game 40 bucks for a conference game if if you're going at the the lane of let's make this free for kids. Should colleges make tickets free? I mean, a lot of colleges do. I mean, other than Ohio State, I think most of the MAC schools in Ohio are free for students to go to any sporting event. Um, we have several of our yeah. sports that are free for students. But, of course, you know, money is king, and Ohio State football is king. And without it, um, you know, Ohio State football pays for almost every other um intercollegiate sport at Ohio State other than men's basketball. So there are pros and cons, and the people like me will pay the money to go to the game, and trust me, my tickets are a heck of a lot more than $40 for a game. Uh, my season tickets right. are you know, $1,000 each because I pay seat licenses and everything else. But it, it's unfair. Right. You're already paying all this stuff to watch TV or paying for cable or paying for satellite. Then that pay extra for a streaming game is ridiculous, okay. and it's getting, it's getting unmanageable. Bill DeMora, a state senator in Ohio. Um, we'll see you the last weekend, last Saturday in November. Have yeah, a great day, you're sir. You're welcome to come uh, to my city. <laughs> if you have tickets, I might take you up on it. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, I Appreciate might. it. I might. Absolutely. All right. So w- w- have a good one. What, a, what about this? Because Pat Ryan sort of laid, laid the foundation for this last year saying, hey, if, if you start making fans pay for basic games, go after the antitrust. Well, what does their, their tuition pay for and their other fees pay for? Most colleges don't charge students to go be supportive of their football team or basketball team. So how much does the college get out of this $3 uh, streaming piece? Is there a revenue share for that? I don't know. But I got to tell you, there's always money in big college sports and in NFL. Follow the money and you'll find out what's motivating everyone. Yeah, it, the money in college sports is getting out of control. We see that with the NIL. We see that with a, a whole host of things. And if this wasn't a state school, I might say there's a problem. But the bigger problem I have okay. is in November when I turn on Michigan State versus Iowa to see three yards in a cloud of dust and a bunch of punts, I don't want to see Oregon and USC. <laughs> the changing of conferences to fit oh, football. Gosh. You're taking me down the football lane. My point being is yeah. it's out of control, and this is just another, <laughs> another Yeah, I, w- I wonder if we're going to see more of this as the money just starts to get bigger and bigger. I, th- I think you're going to probably see more of this at the state level and maybe here in Washington as well, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to, to talk to the senator. Um, all right, as we know, it is the land of the free and equal opportunity, but... While the national deficit and inflation puts the country at a standstill, again, the money theme here, does the American dream still hold true? According to the latest Wall Street Journal poll, as of this year, 49% of Americans say the dream once held true, but not anymore. Now only 34% say the American dream is still there. Flashback to 10 years ago, 42% of people said the dream still holds true. For Kamala Harris, how do you win an election when... I don't know. Folks are sitting there saying, you know what, I, American dream's not attainable. I mean, the, the pandemic obviously is still having an impact. And if you look at the trend lines on this specific type of polling over the last many decades, it's been going in this direction. I mean, clearly, 
we're not doing something right as a nation. People feel like they're working harder and not able to get ahead. It's part of the reason why Kamala Harris has made it a really core part of her message to say you shouldn't be have to just get by. You should be able to get ahead. The no, I'll give you the last word here. The numbers on the economic front are starting to get closer and closer between Trump and Harris. Yeah. And I wonder how that plays into to what what was reported out here. Trump needs to talk about why is it more expensive? Why is the dream out of touch? And I think a lot of the part has, that folks don't talk nearly enough about is regulation. I paid $50 for my first car. Okay, Was hmm. it a piece of junk? Yes, it was. Was it 1984? Right? Yeah, I know it was. But it didn't have to have a backup <laughs> camera. It didn't have to have 15 different people. In that building across the street, every mm-hmm. single day, there's people going around selling stuff saying, okay. please mandate this, and it makes life more expensive. Cars, just one of a thousand different examples. All right, still to come here on the Hill, patriotism protest why one student is banned from flying the American flag at school. Leland Vitter, other side of the break. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Before we say goodbye, here's a story that caught our eye. An Oklahoma high school now sparking some pretty big controversy. As last week, they told a student that the kid couldn't fly an American flag from his truck. Local residents then did did what they do in communities and incidents like this. They rallied around the high school student with over 100 vehicles showing up at the school in protest, many supporting flags of their own. Leland Vittert, host of On Balance. Hello, hello. Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma, yep. Uh, No no surprise. Yep, there we go. Uh, I I was going to talk to you about this for the entirety of what we had left, and then I was like, who does Leland have on the show tonight? You have Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. What are you talking about Dennis Quaid about? He's from Oklahoma. He's on the red carpet. They're doing a release uh, party for, I guess that's the word in Hollywood.